Awesome. All right. So <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, joining the, the interview. And we can just hop right into it. So um, would you be able to give like a little introduction on yourself? Just one, two minutes. Yeah. yeah. So my name is Phil Blystone, um, half American, half Chilean. And um, started playing soccer at four years old. And I kind of stuck with it. And now I'm 25 years old. I had like the opportunity to play in France right out of high school. Uh, kind of grew up playing like travel soccer for a team here in Northern Virginia area. And then I didn't play college soccer, but I did, like I mentioned before, I did play in France for a little bit, then came back, played with a UPSL team that was uh, world class. And then from there, world class, I joined uh, the Maryland Bobcats, which is a NISA team. So they're, that's like third division, I think, U.S. soccer. And uh, now, I'm, now I'm here just training, just trying to, you know, inspire the next generation of, you know, youth soccer. And, you know, I've been training kids for a while now. And, I, you know, it's something that's that possible. I want to kind of continue as like a career, if possible. Um, I did graduate from... Um, university here four years did a got my degree in kinesiology with a, a minor in rehabilitation science because you know I wanted to kind of stay within the sport even after my football career so I wanted to do something in that field because I always loved like the fitness the training and you know that's why I kind of like chose that field but that's kind of a little introduction about me <laughs> that's awesome cool Super interesting. Nice. So I want to just get right, right into the questions. Um, um, so, I mean, I guess a little background on me. I'm trying to, so I just recovered from a knee injury that I had uh, like a year ago. Um, and right now I'm trying to work to get onto my high school's varsity team. So obviously asking a lot of people for advice and training uh, like um, almost every day, et cetera. Um, so here I'm asking you for advice. So, um, if I'm trying to become, um, or just in general, if someone's trying to become a better soccer player, what is, uh, so what should they be doing in every training, every training session? Like I would your, say, sorry, your drills yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So something that you know, my coach taught me at, at a young age and I was like really, really lucky to have him because I felt like he kind of had the blueprint for, you know, youth development. Yeah. And he's a coach that has a lot of experience playing for the Cameroon national team and everything. And he, and he has developed some of the, some very well-known players. Um, this one kid that used to play for us national team, his name was junior Flores. He went to, he played on Borussia uh, Dortmund's second team Andy Sullivan plays on Washington Spirit and Chase Casper plays, I think, at LA right now. But one thing that, you know, he really, you know, kind of ingrained in me was just working on the basics, like juggling and not just regular juggling, like laces juggling. And there's something that I always like to tell people is that there's a difference. You know, you know, the freestyle type of juggling, you know, juggling with your toes has like spinning on it, but he really like emphasized that. He's like, no spin on the ball, really use your laces. And when I started doing that at like 12 years old, I was like, how's this going to help me? Like, I thought he made me do it for like two hours straight. Yeah. And and I was just like, how's this going to help me? Like, this is not game realistic. And little did I, you know, know is that it was going to build the foundation of my technical qualities of footballer because I got so comfortable with the ball using both feet. And I felt like, the way he taught me how to juggle, he would always make me use every body part, the inside of the foot, the outside of the foot, my shoulders, my he like heading the ball, like every single right. like type of like combination you can think of. He would make me do it. Like he would make me kick, uh, kick the ball up high, control it, use left and right. And I feel like I started to understand like why he made me do that. And that's something that I still do to this day. Mm -hmm. And I tell this to all the young players that I, tr I train is like juggling. I saw if it was, like with juggling just for them to get more comfortable with the ball and to be able to yeah. use every part of the foot i think that really helped me just you know build a re really good relationship with the ball 
And it's such a just simple fundamental thing that I think every player needs to do in a warm up or even just like your normal training. And it's great to use because let's say like you have a hard session, juggling is not going to be a super taxing, like taxing right. thing to the body. Yeah. And it's something that you can do in a very small space. You uh-huh. can do it with cleats, you can do barefoot, whatever it is. And it's something that's always going to be like super beneficial to every player. And I, you know, everyone knows like Brazilians are so good at juggling. You know, you've seen those crazy videos. They're like, they're using their hips, yeah. like their shoulders, like they're playing beach soccer. And I think that's something that, you know, I tell every player, if you want to like get really good or something that kind of shows me like, oh, he's really good at the, you know, using his, uh, his, you know, technical qualities, like juggling, juggling for sure. I would say that's something that I've engraved not only into myself, my own training, but I've told others and I felt like it's helped them not just with like their first touch, getting comfortable ball, but also like their shooting technique because keeping your foot flexed, like the way you juggle, it's like the same technique when you're playing a driven pass or when you're finishing. And I feel like that's contributed to like how I got so good using my left foot and right foot is because of just such, such a simple thing. And I just, in that moment when I was 12 years old, I was like, why am I juggling? You know, yeah, yeah. because I just thought it would juggling wouldn't dictate like, oh, how good a player can get. And that's true. Like, I know some players who are amazing footballers and they don't they can't juggle. But the players that I do know that are really good at juggling, I feel like they're much more technical on the ball and much more comfortable with it because they have mm-hmm. a better understanding of how the ball is like hitting off their foot, how it's like traveling throughout the air and all these little small details. It's like it makes a huge difference. So I would say juggling for sure. Juggling for sure. Very underrated. (laughs) Awesome. Um, Another question. Do you think it's um, a good idea to like mix in like cardio or like just body, normal body workout with a training session, like a technical training session? Like let's say you do one shooting drill and then you do like sprints or something and then you do like a dribbling drill and then you do like push ups or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think that's a great way to train because my coach used to always implement some type of fitness with our technical yeah. training. And the reason why he would do that is because he would always tell me if you can maintain that technical quality even while fatigued, then you could do it at any minute of the game. Right, right. Because yeah. like let's say you're tired ta- like let's say, you know, the moment you get tired, the weakest thing is going to go first, whether that's your first touch, your left foot, whatever it is. So if you can maintain that focus and that technical quality, even while fatigued, it doesn't matter what like minute in the game it is, you're going to put it up or 90. You're going to score that game winning chance. And for a lot of players, you know, when they get fatigued or if they're out of shape, they end up missing that chance or they have to cut back to their strong foot because they're not confident enough or they don't have enough energy. So I would always try to implement some type of like fitness. Like, you know, he would have a lot of us, um during our team trainings uh he was actually our head coach for the maryland bobcats he would make our team do suicides and then have us do some passing drills or some small side possession and he would always tell us he's like you guys can't even play two passes while fatigued and like yeah. it was true like we so all a lot of the guys were taking bad touches because they were so tired after the suicides that you know the mental part the soccer iq part went away yeah, so yeah, yeah. he was just so engraved in that he's like you have to be able to play even while you're tired like you have to play well you have to make good decisions you got to be able to play a five-yard pass you have to you know have maintain a good touch and i think implementing those types of trainings like the sprinting or a push up after you do like some technical stuff is amazing because it's going to really show and challenge you. Like, is he still maintaining that good touch even while fatigued? And it requires a lot more energy and focus. Right. So definitely yeah, yeah. for sure. Awesome. Um, what are some good like wall drills that you do? Like with, you know, when you just, when you just have a ball and you just have a ball, like what are some of the best drills that you like to do? I mean, you can never go wrong with one touch, one or two touch, like for sure. I think just working on, I've been recently doing this with so many of the kids I've been training and the one touch and two touch is like just such basic fundamentals that you can always like constantly improve on. And I try to tell these kids is that you should be able to do it 
without making a mistake for like five minutes straight. Like that should be your right. goal or at least go right. as consistent as possible. Because the thing is, is you know how we watch like these top footballers in today's world and we're like, oh, what, like how do they make like a five yard, mis- five yard pass mistake or they make these silly mistakes. In reality, it's like, you know, most of the majority of the game, they're not making that mistake and it looks easy. But in reality, it's like, the percentage of error that they do is so low. It's really small, yeah. And it makes it, they make it look, they make the basics look so easy, but in reality, it's like to stay that consistent and then have that pressure of like all these top players pressuring you on top of that, it's a lot harder than it seems. So making the right pass, even if it's five yards away, is very important. So my favorite drills like are the one to touch because you can never go wrong. And the thing is the next step is to make it more challenging is like, can you go quicker? Like, can you, how, like how game realistic can you do it? And I always like to push myself. I like to hit the ball even harder and harder every time. And yeah, I'm going to make mistakes, but every time I go and do it, I feel like I'm getting a little bit more accustomed to that speed of the ball coming back to me. And eventually when I'm like playing with my friends or teammates or whatever, if they play me a hard pass, I'm like, it's, it's actually slow so <laughs> you're kind of like you're you're, you're kind of pushing yourself it's like you're overloading your body in a way where you're like you're putting your body through something it's not comfortable with mm-hmm. but then when you go back to what's regular it seems easier in a way you know what i mean yeah it's like putting the leg weights on or something exactly it's like it's like going into a heavy squat and doing then doing a box jump it's like wow yeah. this it's so much lighter i feel you know like a feather and essentially, it's the same thing. Like you want to overload your technical like things. Any way where you can make it a little bit more challenging, it's gonna help you get better. And there's always ways you can make it harder and more challenging for yourself. Especially like on the wall, you can play it way harder. Or try to set a timer and be like, okay, I'm I want to go two minutes straight without making one mistake. But I want it to be like game realistic. Like I don't want like a soft pass. Like maybe mm-hmm. if you're first starting out, maybe just like see how well you can do it. And as that gets too easy, try to like give yourself some goals that to make it more challenging. There's always ways where you can make it harder and more challenging. I just think Mm -hmm. people are just kind of looking at it, you know, from a different perspective that there's always ways you can make it, you know, more fun, more challenging, and you can always get better even at the most basic things. So that's pretty much one, two touch. And I had I also made a YouTube video where like I literally filmed like 11 different wall drills <laughs> and like, but there's millions of different combinations yeah. you could do. Honestly, at the end of the day, like there's mm-hmm. so many wall drills that you could come up with, you know, outside the foot touch, inside the foot touch across, like there's hundreds of different types of things. But then the day sticking with the basic, the one, two touch is like, you can never go wrong with those two things for sure. Right, right. Awesome. <laughs> and so h- how do you say, or in your opinion, like, how do you translate those, all those technical, like, dribbling skills and dribbling drills into actual, like, game match, like, dribbling? Because there's obviously a difference. Yeah. So there's this uh, one YouTuber I follow. His, um, his name's Ryan. And he pl- he's, like, currently in, like, the third division in England, has a really awesome YouTube channel, center back player and one of the things he mentioned is like doing these cone drills it's useless it's not game realistic and i was like dang like i do cone drills like (laughs) like i felt kind of bad about myself but in a way like he was right like i understand it's not game realistic um like the weaving in and out but it still builds a really good foundation of like just getting more comfortable with the ball just like juggling like you're not going to be juggling in a soccer game (laughs) but it's going to help you get more comfortable with the ball and how these drills like translate more into like a game realistic thing is that I'd like to kind of build up into it. Like, let's say I do like a straight line of cones and do like some zigzag, like the next drill, I might open it up even more. And I start traveling. Maybe like I might have the yard, uh, the cones like 10 yards apart instead of like one foot apart. So Mm -hmm. now I'm covering more distance and now it's like a little bit more game realistic where I'm traveling, you know, 10 yards instead of just zigzagging in between like one foot of cones, you know? So that's going to help me more in a game because like some of the most basic drills I like to do is I like to dribble towards a cone and cut in. I dribble like 10 to 15 yards. I dribble at it at full speed, 
do a simple cut in and finish. And I repeat that, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 times. And I'm just trying to engrave that, you know, muscle memory into my body yeah. of doing those drills. But if you do those cone drills that are just in place and ball master drills all the time, you're going to, you're going to feel so uncomfortable when you go into a game, when you have to make that, you know, that run of like 10 to 15 yards because you're, you're so used to just staying in place. Right. So right. implementing some type of drills where you're actually covering more distance and maybe attacking a cone at full speed is going to be something that's going to be more, I want to say it's going to, it's not going to be more better. It's, it's not going to be better, but it's going to help. It's going to be more easier for you to translate that into a game versus the ball mastery drills that you do just in place. So make sure you do a, a mix of both. That's the best yeah. thing. I think, you know, if you just stick with one thing, it's, you know, it's, it's actually going to hinder you. Right, but implementing right. some simple things of like movements you do in a game is going to be the most beneficial thing. Like, I don't know what position you play. What position you play? Midfield. So, so one of the most important things for you is like maybe turning and accelerating five, 10 yards. Yeah. Because that's something that you would probably do. You're checking into either center back, checking in um, out wide to receive from out wide and working on those like quick bursts of, you know, a sprint speed is something that you can work on. Like have a friend just play the ball, you turn and you accelerate 10 yards and then you finish or you find another pass. Those are like things that movements that you would do in a game. And those are going to be more beneficial to you versus like you zigzagging through a cone. Like that's one foot apart and then shooting. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's going to translate better. So like, I like to implement a lot of things like movements I would do in a game. So I'm a fullback. So what I will do is I have one of my friends play me a ball down the line. I sprint, I whip in across, and then I sprint back because as a fullback, you have to attack. You're gonna I play a lot of crosses in a game, and then I have to track back a lot. And then there's times where I actually have an opportunity to cut in just like a winger does. So yeah. the next thing is I take I get a ball from a wide, I dribble down line, I cut in and I finish on goal. Very simple. Like it, I think a lot of times people try to overcomplicate it, and it's really just Try to think of movements that you do in a game and just try to replicate it as the best as you can and just repeat that so that once you go into a game, you're like, oh, I I'm, I'm used to this, these movements. Like I do it in my trainings. Like mm -hmm. it just, it's more pressure now because you actually have people pressing you. Right. Right. Makes yeah. sense. Um, so what are some good like players to watch just to like, I mean, obviously it's always good or I guess to rephrase the question. Do you think it's a good idea to like watch other players as like as an example or just to like see what like a really good example does? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's something that's told by so many coaches is to watch players that play your position and especially at a high level. Like yeah. like you probably watch Gavi, Manzaball or Pedri, like all these young talent, like my favorite midfielders were like the duo was Xavi and Yesta. Like they were like the dynamic duo gods. Like that's when like Barcelona was at its prime. Like these guys are yeah. like, I, w I don't play 10, but I used to watch these guys, especially like to the way they controlled in the midfield, the way they were scanning constantly. If you watch them, like they're looking like three to four times before even getting a ball. Yeah. Which is insane because like, <laughs> Because sometimes when you get tired in a game, you just forget to like look. So watching yeah, them do that the full ninety minutes against going against like some of the top players in the world is just incredible. And I definitely think watching players that play your position is probably one of the most beneficial things. To analyze what they do, see like their dis why they make certain decisions is very important because then you can definitely pick up on some things, and you can never go wrong with learning something new, especially players that already play at a high level, of course. You know, they have such amazing players around them, so it's not going to be exactly the same when you go on the field. But you mm -hmm. can always learn something new from a top player. It's, it's, I think it's always good to watch. No matter what level a player is, it's good to analyze and see what they do and, and how they react to different, you know, situations because every player is different. Yeah. And, yeah. Y like, you're going to see, like, a winger like Vinicius versus, like, a, a winger like Mares, like you know the, they're two different players but like they they might do something completely different you know mm. 
And okay. that's that's something. There's some players that are more conservative, and there's some players that are like very flary. So they're gonna do stuff like everyone knows Neymar. Like he does crazy yeah. things, <laughs> and then you're gonna see some other players that are just like they won't do that, and they'll just play the simple one too. So depending on your playing style and like how you want to play as a footballer, like it really depends. But you know, for me, I always love to have. You know, the reason why I play football is because like I love to express myself and do some of these crazy things. So I think it's cool that you know you implement that because we all play the beautiful game because you know it's fun and you know you always want to add some flair to your games. But you can never go wrong with a simple one too. And right, at right. the end of the day, you know players usually choose that. But it's always good to express yourself too and try something new. Definitely, definitely. Cool. Um, <clears throat> just based on your opinion as being a soccer player all your life. Do you think, or is there anything in your diet that like helps you be more fit? I wouldn't say like a, you know, specific food. I think having a balance is the most important thing. I think a lot of players, some players, like I used to take it to the extreme and I was like tracking every single thing I was eating. Like I was using this app, like my fitness pal, And, like, when I was in high school, I was probably, like, at 6% body fat. Like, I had, like, veins going through everywhere. I was – it was bad. Because the thing is, yeah, I was very lean, but I was Mm -hmm. extremely tired all the time because I just had no body fat at all. And it helped me at some point, but I felt like you need a balance because you can't be at such a low body fat. I think you need to have some fat on you. And because that's going to provide you the energy you need to play in those games. I felt like it was a lot harder for me to kind of have that energy that I needed to have, like right at the beginning, kind of took me a while to kind of get the engine started. And, but eventually when like I was warmed up, I felt like, you know, okay, I was able to hold it, but I always felt tired and fatigued. So I think Mm -hmm. having a good balance between your meals, you can still have your favorite foods. You can still have pizza. You can still enjoy it as long as the majority of your meals are still like balanced, like making sure you get your vegetables, making sure you get your protein and like your fiber. All all those are very important. Like all those things is like just having a balance, like the balance, having a good balance is like everything because some people take it to the extreme. They're like, I can't have this. I can't have that. And like, I understand like you want it to be like, Ronaldo, like Ronaldo's like everyone, he's like, he doesn't drink, he doesn't like eat anything processed and stuff. And like, you know, that's great. But like, you know, sometimes people are in different situations at home, so we can't always, you know, get the best thing. So, yeah. you know, trying to find a balance is going to be the best thing. So just make sure you just, you know, have your chicken, your salmon, you know, so many different like forms of protein. Um, but just you know, you can you can enjoy your your favorite treats every once in a while as long as it's not every day. But yeah, I yeah, think yeah. you know, I think um, I know this is a little bit off topic, but this is not like towards nutrition. But I think I kind of live off by these pillars, and it's like staying hydrated, good sleep, and like good nutrition. Like I think if you like maintain those three pillars, like you should be good because number one, sleep is like the foundation of like your recovery sleeping. That's where yep. like your body is able to recover. If you're not getting enough sleep, like you're more likely to, you're more prone to getting injuries. You're, yeah. you're going to feel so much heavier going into your next session because you're still tired from whatever you had, like that previous session. So you're not yeah. optimizing your recovery. Number two, hydration is just as important because like if you're not hydrated, you're dehydrated, you're probably going to have a headache you're going to get fatigued much quicker. And it's just very important that you stay hydrated. It's going to help flush out all those toxins out of your body. And it's just, you're just going to perform a lot better. You're hydrating so much. And when you hydrate, you're just going to feel a lot better. And then obviously, you know, nutrition is very important too. What you put into your body is what you get out. Like, right, you only get, right. imagine your body being a Lamborghini. Like, you're going to put the best <laughs> fuel. Like, why, why are you going to put crap in your Lamborghini? You know, you're damaging yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, you know, you're going to put the best fuel into it because you want to take care of it because you only get one body. Remember that. So making sure that you, you know, put the best fuel into your body, it's going to optimize its performance just like a car does. Mm -hmm. So if you do those three things, I think, you know, you're going to give you a better chance or you're more likely to succeed. There's like, there should be no excuses. Like sometimes like injuries are inevitable. They happen, but like, you're going to reduce it by a lot. If you do like, if you maintain those three things, in my opinion. Right. Awesome. Um, do you have like any 
advice or opinion on like how to reduce the probability of like cramping in a game or like you know what i mean just feeling that like yeah just... yes so like honestly i've never cramped in a game and it's Are you crazy. Serious? yeah i've never <laughs> cramped in a game ever i don't know why but like it looks i mean it looks so painful but i've never cramped and i think one of the reasons to that's because number one you got to prehydrate so before going into a match or training i feel like i'm already drinking enough water and hydrating enough like it keep in mind it's not just water i think i you know i usually have a gatorade or some some drink that has some sort of like sodium and potassium and i think having that balance and then you know feeling my body well before my training helps me prevent and then also you also have to hydrate throughout the training if you're not hydrating throughout the training or during your game it's you know by halftime then you know the odds of you cramping are gonna be much higher but i feel like i always did a good job always had a water on hand and some electrolyte drink and i would always like take a sip of the gatorade sip of the water nothing too crazy but i never really cramped ever so i think making sure you prehydrate be is one of the most important things and then also making sure you're hydrated throughout your training or by halftime try to hydrate at halftime as well those things are going to really help prevent any any cramps and sometimes you know it still happens but at least you're going to reduce reduce the chance of you cramping definitely definitely um do you use like any like breathing techniques per se like when you're running or like doing cardio or anything like that i mean i i ran cross country in high school so i feel like one of the things you know that kind of helped me was like just trying to take a deep breath and try to slow down my heart rate as quickly as possible so i would take a really deep breath and kind of hold that breath so i would inhale through my nose and then like hold all the air in like my stomach and then exhale and i would try to kind of relax like almost in a way where like i would try to not only calm my breathing down but mentally i would also try to calm my like because i if i thought this is how i thought of it is like if i could calm myself mentally then i can slowly calm down my breathing as well so i kind of be like relax you know relax you got this you know type of thing and, you know, I would apply that to workouts, you know, very nerve wracking games and stuff like that, because, you know, controlling your breathing is very important because if you're hyperventilating or breathing too hard, you're going to you're, you're going to fatigue much quicker. So yeah. when I was able to kind of get my breathing under control, I was able to, you know, get right back to it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Cool. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, do you have like any it's pretty open-ended but like any advice in terms of like um doing trials because i'm sure you've done a ton of trials like this being in terms of like i don't know pre pre pre-trial mentality like what you focus on during the actual training you know what i mean yeah i mean leading up to a trial is definitely (laughs) it's it's very nerve-wracking it's a lot of pressure because obviously you want to perform well you want to stand out and you want to get the attention of the coaches. Of course, that's the yeah. end goal. Um, I think, I think at realizing, I think I, I kind of give myself like, I kind of like a self-talk in a way, like saying like, Oh, I did everything in my power. So like all I can do is like kind of trust God in a way. And, uh, but going into my trainings, all I could do was, just give it my all. I think, you know, one of the biggest things that helped me is like, especially going on trial in France, it was really nerve wracking. I would walk into the locker room and like people would be looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? And, you know, you know, I didn't speak French. So, right. and, you know, I think once they found out I was American too, I was, they were like, oh man, American, like uh, their soccer is, is awful. Like this guy's probably just as bad type of thing. And, you know, going into these trials, I think you have to be very mentally strong, just have to trust everything, all the training you've done, you just have to trust yourself. And when, once you kind of accept and know your ability as a player, if you're able to kind of transfer that into their trial, like, I feel like, you know, you can really do anything. I no, I was always nervous going to these trials. Like, don't get me wrong. I was. It's not like I walked in there like I'm the best, like type of thing. I was nervous because I didn't want to make a mistake. I didn't want to make myself look like a fool. But I think the same way 
where like when the whistle's blown, I feel like that's when everything kind of like that's when like mentally I kind of switch on, where the nervousness goes away in a in a, in like I would say completely, but I think I kind of lock in, mm-hmm. and I'm like okay, like you know everything I've trained for, everything I've done, I'm ready for this. You know now I just have to showcase it, and I think going into the training is like just start off you know with some simple things just being able to do the basic like don't overcomplicate it when you go into these trials do the simple things build up your confidence there's always like people saying like do a couple passes first build up that confidence and then once you start feeling yourself then start doing the things that you might not do right off the bat you know start expressing yourself as a player and i want to tell the story because i feel like it (laughs) I feel like it was one of the best times I played. And this is when I was at uh, this League Two club on trial, um, Loav. And this is the club that Pugba started at. Oh, damn. And uh, so I was training with their U19 academies on trial. And I was in this drill. We were doing like a passing thing. And my coach would always tell me, he's like, if you don't understand, just stand in line. Like stand behind somebody so you can watch. And for this first drill, like, no one was behind me. I was the first person in this line. So, like, I was like, oh, nah, I'm about to, about to make myself look like a, a fool. And luckily, I was able to, like, kind of pick it up. But I was, like, focusing so hard. The hardest I've ever done in my life. Like, no no school. Like, I, this was, like, the hardest I ever thought. And luckily, I was able to do it. And I was like, oh, man. But we later went into some small-sided possession. And no one was passing me in the ball. And I was like, I was kind of low key, kind of getting frustrated because I was like, why are these guys not passing the ball? Like, I'm on their team, like, I'm wide open, I'm calling for it, type of thing. And that's when I was like, I kind of took matters into my own hand and I won the ball. I started winning the ball myself because I was just tired. Like, these guys are not going to pass to me. I'm just going to do it myself. So I started winning the ball, started playing it to them. And then they started kind of realizing, okay, this guy's not that bad. Like, and so once they started passing the ball, I started feeling, okay, like, look, they're trying to trust me. I, I can finally like, showcase, like, you know, what, what I can do. And then once we finished that first session of the day, we had the second session in the afternoon, which was, you know, small-sided games. Mm-hmm. And one of my teammates played a through ball. He got fouled. They called a penalty, and then they all pointed to me. They're like, American, American. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm not. Like, they wanted me to take the PK because they wanted to. It, this was a time whether, you know, I gained the respect or they just clowned me forever. And they, you know, that's when I, I basically lose the respect. So this is something that, you know, when I was walking up to take the PK, it was like, I have to, I have to make this because I know if I make this, I'll gain the respect. Right. And if I miss it, they probably just, you know, the sad reality is that they probably won't respect me. You know, they probably won't, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll accept the fact that, oh, he's bad. He's not good enough to be here type of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is something, you know, I would work on after every session, I would take a PK. I would do it when the lights were off. I would do it when it was snowing. I've done it thousands of times. And when I set that ball up, I was like, I've done this a thousand times. Like, this is no different. And so when I stepped up to take up that PK, you know, I took a deep breath in and, you know, I thought, okay, like if this guy thinks I'm terrible, I'm going to look at the spot where I'm going to take the PK. So I was looking at like the top left corner and I was like, hoping I was like, okay, he's going to, he's going to be like, damn, this guy's so dumb. He's looking at the spot. He's going to take it. So, you know, I ran up and then I put it top right corner and I scored it. And it was the most relieving thing in my life because all my teammates came and celebrated with me. And they're like, I'm Eddie Khan. Yeah. Like in a joking <laughs> way, like they're like, they're joking with me. But just making that PK took so much stress off my body that like literally right after that, I think I had like, I just had so much confidence in me that I, I felt like I was able to play free, play the way I wanted that, you know, I ended up scoring like two more goals. I was awesome. getting like another assist. And then the coach, he talked to me after and he's like, I want you to train with the reserves tomorrow. So keep in mind, I'm only 17 years old and he's telling me to go train with the older guys now the next day. And so that, that was a huge thing for me because now I'm training with, a, well, there's a couple guys. There's one kid who was playing at the time was, was playing with the U17 French national team. And he was huge. 
This was this man was not 17 for sure. This man had a kid at home for sure. <laughs> no, this man was built for 17 year old. He was massive, but he was playing on the French national team. He was a, a right back, and uh, I was able to play with a lot older guys, mm-hmm. and uh, and so it was really eye opening. And I think you know going into these trials, I've done so many college ID camps, uh, yeah. you know, and I think you just gotta trust your training, trust the program, and you have to go in there confident. I think. You know, it's definitely <laughs> harder said than done. But I think if you're confident enough in your own training, if you've done the basics hundreds of times and, you know, your training is good, I, I don't see why not be confident, why be nervous going into these trials. Like, because you made, you've done the basics, now it's just applying it to, like, a normal training session. Right. And right. a lot of times I think people, like, under underestimate themselves i think a lot of people kind of put mm-hmm. themselves in this shell where they get nervous but in reality like some of these players aren't that much better than you like there's really not much i think there's just some kids who are amazing don't get me wrong they're amazing but you can be just as good some of these kids have just been in that system for longer so they adapted to it if you can right, put right. in like for, like example you if i put you into like a professional soccer team and i leave you there for like up two months like i guarantee you like you come back to your regular team no one will recognize you because you you just got accustomed to that high level of playing right and it's not even like oh it's like felipe is not even that good like it's like you had the potential you just you just didn't under, you just didn't know it and sometimes you just need people to believe in you and sometimes you don't have people believing you so you have to be the person that believes in yourself and um you know, it, it's, it could be hard. I understand. Like I've been on, I've been to several trials and you just gotta, you can't give up. You just gotta work hard. Even if you lose it, even if you make that mistake, you know, just maintain, you know, stay calm and just remember, you know, everything that you've been doing at all the training you've been doing and just give it your all because at the end of the day, like, I think, you know, as long as you try and give your all, that's all you can ask for, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's always like trials and things that you can always look back and learn from. I think that's the great thing about it is that you can walk away from a trial, even if it doesn't like turn out good and just, you know, get feedback from the coaches, people and ask like what you did wrong so that you mm-hmm. can go to the next trial even better or stronger. And then you learn from that because I've done so many college ID camps. I've done like all these trials. I've tried out for hundreds of teams. Like I- I've done it all. And I think it's, it's it's the same pattern like you just gotta be confident in yourself your ability and i think that starts with within your training yeah it definitely starts within your training um you gotta you gotta work hard you gotta you gotta you gotta set your standards very high for yourself too mm-hmm. and always strive to like be better and you know to continue working hard i think those are like the most important thing i feel like you know one thing that separated me from other people is like my work ethic and it's because like you have to want it bad because in my head i was like there's someone out there working harder than me yeah there's always someone working out here working harder than you like there's always going to be someone that's out there grinding when you're not so you always have to remember that and i feel like that's always something that i kept in the back of my head and i always like always strive to like you know push myself and work hard because sometimes like some kids they get lazy and there's some kids that are naturally talented but that doesn't last forever you know Mm -hmm. So hard work beats talent. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's so that's my long <laughs> that's my long rant. <laughs> no man, thank you so much. I I appreciate it a ton, and like this has helped me a lot. Yeah, I'm really glad. But yeah, just uh, I would you know just in terms of like trying to because you said you're trying out for your high school team. Yeah, for varsity. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I mean, like, don't be afraid. Just like make surround yourself with players good players like find people who are better than you and surround yourself with them even if it's older guys like find find an adult team in your area where you live and play with those older guys those older guys will like take you under the wing there's a lot of nice people out there they'll tell you like they're like hey like they'll give you good tips and like you need to play with men like you're still young so the sec this if you're not a part of like a professional academy the second best thing is to find an adult team and I think that's going to mimic like a first team experience in a way. Right, right. 
So, so if you can put yourself in a, in, a, in a team, you know, even if you can ask the coach, be like, hey, coach, like, if he doesn't tell you, like, oh, you can't join the team, be like, hey, can I train with the guys? That's the second best thing, you know? But there's always going to be an adult team out there for sure that are always looking for young, like, talented players like you. So, you know, you just got to put yourself out there, just reach out. And there's, in this day and age, like, there's so many more adult teams popping up, like semi pro UPSL teams, like so many different, you know, teams out there. So I think for the younger high schoolers, like definitely look for an adult team if you're not part of an academy yet. Like if you want to get that first team experience, play with older guys. Mm-hmm. Like that's going to be the best thing because they're gonna, number one, a lot of these guys are going to have more experience. Number two, they're going to be like, a lot of these guys are going to be a lot bigger, stronger, and faster. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to push you to play quicker. You're going to have to think faster. You're going to have to use your body. Like you might get pushed off, but that's going to make you think quicker. And you're going to have to get rid of the ball. And sure. The second thing, like going back to like surround yourself, like I had, I was lucky enough to have really good players that were better than me. And I would always want to be like, Hey, let's go train. Let's go train. And I, I would always love to work with people who are better than me because they would always push me. Right. They would constantly push me. And then eventually I was starting to surpass them because I was doing more work outside of the trainings we we're doing too. Yeah. Yeah. And so those are like, that's my tip for you. If you like, I think you can definitely, I think, you know, varsity for you should be something not easy, but I think you can easily achieve it. I think it's more of like a mindset thing. Like just, you know, plan it out, just, you know, see what you have to do to accomplish that goal and like what things you have to work on because every player has like their weaknesses. You know, for me, it was like, Oh, you know, taking on players, so the next couple of months, I just focus on doing one v ones with my friend, right. yeah. just to build that confidence to the point where my weakness became a strength. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So you know, you if you can find ways where you can improve on the things you're not good at, I I don't see why not. You know, so yeah. you know, you know, everyone has it. Just you just gotta figure it out, create a plan, and then execute. Definitely. Definitely, man. All right. Um, I think it's a good time to end up for a little bit our our conversation. But um, thank you. Uh, it's Philip, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's funny because my mom calls me Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Wait, what yeah. part of Chile you're from? Uh, uh, Santiago. Santiago, cool, nice. I have yeah. a friend from there. His name is Vicente. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah, but thank you so much. It, it it was an honor to uh to be on this and hopefully you're able to, you know, take some tips and if you ever need help or anything, just feel free to hit me up. I could like definitely give you some drills or anything you need because you know, I always love helping people and it's just like especially with like soccer like or football, whatever like any way I can help somebody like get better or just, you know, help them stand out, you know, it's always it's always an honor, honestly. So Thank so you, just, man. Yeah, I'll yeah. definitely be watching this recording of back and like taking notes and stuff. So <laughs> awesome, man. Just keep up the good work, okay? Yeah. All right. Oh man. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for it. Always, man. Take care. Bye.